My friends, Ukrainian forces just raised the blue and yellow flag on the Russian town of Suja. And many other settlements in Kursk Oblast are being stripped of the white, blue, red flag. While Ukrainian tanks continue this frenetic charge across the countryside. It's been two weeks since the start of the Kursk offensive. And the Russian army is taking a severe beating on their home turf. I understand it's quite ungentlemanly to compare sizes. But just take a look at the territorial gains of the Ukrainian Kursk offensive versus Russia's Kharkiv offensive. It's night and day. And let's just say the Ukrainian bulge might expand even more very soon. As the Ukrainians are currently pushing west and east of their breachhead, Ukrainian assault detachments are currently reforming ranks, while their attacks benefit from the support of friendly airstrikes. With that being said, the Kursk offensive is also not sunshine and rainbows for Ukraine. Progression slowed down in the last few days. Columns of Russian reinforcements composed of armored vehicles and self-propelled howitzers are pouring into Kursk Oblast. And most importantly, the Russian army is continuously making gains in Donbass. As Ukrainian journalist Saplinko reported on Telegram, the Kursk offensive did not have the desired effect on the Pokrovsky direction. On a similar note, Military Land wrote, Russian forces are about 15 kilometers away from Pokrovsk and 10 kilometers from Mirnohrad. It just remains to hope that Tsersky knows what he's doing. Both cities are very valuable. However, Ukraine still has a couple cards to play. That's right, we're witnessing one of the biggest gambles of the war. I'll be honest, at this point in time, they have no other choice but to go all in. One of General Patton's favorite quotes was De l'audace, encore de l'audace, toujours de l'audace. Audacity, more audacity, always audacity. There's still plenty of very juicy targets that Ukraine could aim for, like Glushkovo, Rilsk, Lgov, or even Oboyan. Imagine the military political impact if the Ukrainians managed to cut the road linking Kursk to Bielgarad. Another fuck up. Another fuck up. And as we speak, the German headquarters is low-key reliving some serious flashbacks. This Ukrainian offensive against Kursk Oblast definitely boosted the morale of the entire armed forces. Here the SBU reported 102 Russian prisoners of war captured during the first day. This was a historic moment for Ukraine because that was the most massive capture of enemy troops at one time. If they can achieve this two years and a half into the war, this means there's still hope for Ukraine. All this to say that Ukraine can still achieve more territorial gains inside Russia by continuously infiltrating enemy lines with small units. Like these paratroopers of the 3rd Battalion 2nd Air Assault Brigade that ambushed a Russian supply truck with the help of their striker APC. We also noticed the arrival of additional Ukrainian reinforcements, such as this unit equipped with British-made Challenger 2 tanks. The Ukrainians might actually even get more tanks into Korsk Oblast. Here from CBC, Ukraine cleared to use armor donated by Canada on Russian territory. Maybe we'll soon see Canadian Leopard 2 tanks that are personally blessed with my own hand charge into Kursk Oblast. Before we start, I wanted to show you this discussion I had five months ago, which is, spoiler alert, very similar to what we're witnessing today. You have to bring the war to the Russians. Yeah. You have to let the Russians feel what war in Ukraine is like. You no, know, you bring it to the Russians, you bring it to Belgorod, let Belgorod become a become another Bakhmut. You no know, then suddenly you have some bargaining chip. But, you know, the, the thing is that if you go crazy, sometimes if you just go crazy, you just hit the bee's nest and you're like, let's go. Because yeah. on the on the east side of Belgorod, there is massive forest. Like I'm looking right now at the map, massive forests that are not mined because it's Russian territory. You cannot mine all the villages on your own land. There's no fortifications, trenches. And it is Russian territory. <laughs> it, no, because the, the, because people my live there. Is. People yeah, live there. Like, you go all you, in, you, 
which is why I say Belgorod because it's not going to be so heavily yeah. defended. You can capture major grounds after you capture, and then you negotiate with Russia and say, "I go to trade ground with you. I give you back Belgorod. You give us back Kherson or Zaporizhia, something like this. You know, the, the, it, you can do some trade and then end the war. And so, if the Ukrainians do one major one and they broke through the initial line that was prepared to fight, mm-hmm. well, it's going to be all hell break loose, and you don't even know where the units go because once they spread out, is Oh, then you're gonna have like major and, guerrilla war all over the place. And we saw there were already attacks near, uh, like uh, in raids across the Belgorod border, and they pushed ten kilometers almost, or I don't know how much, before they were but stopped. But it's not enough. It's but not imagine enough if that... now that you had ten thousand men. Exactly. So ten thousand men. You through that they, first line they, of defense. They capture Belgorod. Wrong, they capture Belgorod within like couple, easy. And then and they went to go, go and hit the wall. Oh my freaking We God. play too much Hearts to of Iron, bro. Yuri, write this down now. Let's launch preemptive strike on Kharkiv to prevent this Belgorod offensive. Welcome to History Legends. Here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. Currently, Russia is playing the Baghdad Bob card regarding the situation in Kursk. But Ukrainian forces are still roaming 18 kilometers away from Lgov. So to prevent any unpleasant penetration, the Russians already started the construction of a new defensive line. Like this 5 km long anti-tank ditch between the village of Selekcioni and Lgov along the E38 road. Or even worse, this trench line near Arturovka, 26 km southwest of Kursk. With that being said, Ukraine has to move fast. Otherwise, they'll be pinned down and crushed under Russian firepower. So, as a quick summary of the operational situation at the moment. Ukrainian progression northwards towards Lgov is proving to be difficult, as one of their columns got ambushed pretty bad near Kautchuk. More on that later. So the Ukrainian army is preparing an operation to capture all this ground in the Glushkovo district, south of the same river. Their Russian positions are continuously being pummeled by artillery and aviation. There the rumor goes that up to 3,000 Russian soldiers are at risk of being cut off especially since all the pontoons are being destroyed by enemy fire or FPV drones. So we covered the central part of the bridgehead, the western part, now let's take a look at the eastern side. There Ukrainian forces are expanding their area of control around the town of Suja that they just captured, and are now increasing the pressure on Belitsa and all the settlements around the Psyl river. Everything is going so well for the Russians that in response, The Russian authorities already ordered the evacuation of the entire civilian population of both these areas. There are also rumors that the Korsk offensive is just a diversion. Maybe, but all I can tell you is that Ukraine is about to annex some part of Korsk Oblast, which they believe to be part of their historical sphere of influence. For example, Ukrainian telegram channels don't call this region Korsk region, but Korschina, the old Ukrainian name for it. To this effect, General Alexander Sirsky announced the establishment of a military administration to take in charge all the settlements now under Kiev's control. Others compared this Ukrainian operation to the folly of the river crossing in Krynki. I completely disagree. There are 10-20 times more troops involved. Ukrainian infantry is directly supported by armored units. They're actually taking massive ground. And there is an entire logistics flow supplying all the troops and allowing rotations. Oh yeah, before covering the day-by-day analysis of the situation since my last video, I wanted to show you this. A couple days ago, the French Center of Research and Intelligence wrote, Ukrainian offensive in Russia, tactical success, but strategic error. I don't necessarily agree with what they had to say, but they did bring up an important point. For example, they say that the Ukrainian concentration of forces in the Sumy region did not go unnoticed. What was surprising, however, was the unexpected use of this military force. One might have thought that this gathering was aimed at reducing the salient created by the Russians in the Kharkiv region. Remember what I told you in my last video, wasn't it exactly what I thought? Now, to turn the tide, Ukraine is pulling an ace out of its sleeves. The Ukrainian command is gathering battalions from various units. 
to form some sort of armored task force that I will nickname Kampfgruppe Wolfstadt. For now, the bulk of these units are camouflaged somewhere in Kharkiv, but the first local counterattacks have already started. The objective of this counteroffensive is to push the Russians back to the border. This goes to show that Ukrainian Maskirovka was there. Unlike during the 2023 summer offensive, Ukrainian recon units properly scouted the area. This time they made sure to punch the soft belly of the enemy. That's how Ukrainian armored units crushed the Russian 17th and 18th battalions of conscripts that were guarding the border. The Times talked to Ukrainian soldiers who took part in day one of the offensive and they said they were just kids. When they saw us, they surrendered immediately. Just imagine what all these teenage conscripts must have been through. One of the Russian prisoners of war Ukraine captured was 21-year-old Anton of the 20th Battalion of the 43rd Railway Brigade. You heard that right, not Spetsnaz, Railway Brigade. These are the guys that held Karenieva and stopped the Ukrainian push against the city. In a way, we can say they saved the Russian front line from collapsing altogether. Another one was an 18-year-old Russian conscript, Alik Satika from the 18th Battalion of the 488th Mortal Rifle Regiment. Remember we spoke about this unit in my last video. Here we see some more of these 18, 19-year-old conscripts that were captured. They say that their commanders fought side by side with them and stayed until the very end. The mainstream media decided to unleash on Russia for using conscripts on the border, CNN. Putin promised poorly trained conscripts wouldn't be sent to war, the New York Times. During Ukraine's incursion, Russian conscripts recount surrendering in droves. Wow, max level dishonesty. Shocking that Russia follows the law and deploys its conscripts on its own territory. In the end, let's not forget how these conscripts held the town of Suja for days on their own while being encircled. But at war, you need more than just courage. Day 10, the 15th of August. By day 10, Ukrainian armed forces and supply convoys poured into Russian territory, namely through the Suja border crossing checkpoint. This is where Russia begins. It's startling to see the steady flow of military vehicles, that probably an ambulance and armor just passing through the Russian border point here. What's interesting in this video is how Ukrainian soldiers were apparently unaware that they would take part in this Korsk offensive. This is because General Sersky wanted to maintain complete operation security and not allow moles to leak the plans. The Soviets did the same thing during World War II. That way, if their soldiers were captured, they would have no information to tell the enemy. This reminds me of this story by Ukrainian newspaper Apostrov. Pay attention to the release date, July 30th, one week before the start of the offensive. Essentially, the brigade commander of the 80th Air Assault Brigade was relieved of command because he was against a combat mission somewhere in Donbass, which he believed was disproportionate to the strength and capabilities of his brigade. Now, that's all he revealed to the media because, I quote, the disclosure of even the smallest details could have a bad effect on the military personnel of the 80th Air Assault Brigade. You guessed it, the secret combat mission somewhere in Donbass was actually the Korsk Offensive. Once again, Ukraine played the few cards they had in their hands very well. Here's another interesting article, this time by Military Land on the 28th of July. The 225th Assault Battalion received Madas. Surprise, surprise, this was one of the shock units tasked with breaking through the border. All right, all right, back to the events of the 15th of August. As you can see in this video, a Ukrainian vehicle was destroyed on the eastern end of the village of Makhnovka. This more or less confirms that the village is now under Ukrainian control. That same day, Russian drones also targeted three Cossack 2 MRAPs around the villages of Bondarevka and Mikhailovka. If we look at the map, these drone strikes happened right here in these two villages. This means Suja is now fully secured and under Ukraine control, but also the villages on the outskirts. So yeah, it's always the same story. This time it's Russian telegram channels that are celebrating these drone strikes. But in reality, the only thing they demonstrate is how enemy forces keep advancing. Meanwhile, further south, Ukrainian reconnaissance and sabotage groups pushed east of Plehovo towards Borki and Spalnoye. 
We know this because of this footage of infantrymen walking through this village of Spalnoye, and the Russians are trying to harass the newly built enemy entrenchments using various drones. Here you can see a Ukrainian assault detachment that captured an enemy 82mm Vasilek automatic mortar in the sector. It seems that despite the failure of the armored blitz on Giri, Ukraine is still willing to push towards Belitsa. This town is currently about 8 kilometers from the forward Ukraine positions in this sector. If the Ukrainians can muster enough pack a punch in this area, they could theoretically push along the forested banks of the Psyl River all the way to Oboyan and cut off the road linking Kursk to Bielgarad. I'm getting ahead of myself, but keep an eye on the sector. Now let's take a look at the central part of the breachhead. In the sector, the front is very fluid. We're talking about mobile warfare. So we're witnessing a lot of attacks and counterattacks. Positions are often lost and then regained. So we don't have a clear idea of what ground Ukraine actually controls. As you can see on this map by Defense Politics Asia, there seem to be a number of islands of defenders that are more or less encircled, like the Russian troops in the area north of Malaya Loknia. That's where we got the video of a Russian soldier burning an abandoned Ukrainian BMP-1 with gasoline. But we could also say something similar about the Russian forces in Kremianoye, whose real whereabouts are unknown. So we have Russian troops near Malaya Loknia, all the while having some Ukrainian forces being spotted near Safonovka. These guys are 16 kilometers away from Rgov. If they take the city, they cut off the entire logistic supply lines going to Rilsk and Koreneva. Here we have a video from the same city of Rgov, where Russian TV reporters all of a sudden came under heavy shelling, and we just see them quickly running away from the area. Although this axis of attack proved to be very promising for Ukraine, one of its light armored columns got a bloody nose when they got ambushed near the village of Kauchuk. I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned it at the end of my last video. But now we have more footage and we know what actually happened. Apparently, a Ukrainian column composed of about 12 MRAPs was stopped and ambushed by a Russian BTR-80 that just ripped through them using its 30mm autocannon. Here you can see the aftermath, two destroyed Cossack-2 MRAPs. Meanwhile, riflemen of the 810th Mem Brigade finished the job. Essentially, the Ukrainian column pushed along the main road, passing through the hamlet of Safonovka. The Russians decided to ambush them with an L-type ambush. It's a classic. The BTR showed up to block the enemy's axis of advance and fired them at point blank. Meanwhile, from the flanks, we can believe hidden ATGM teams and riflemen fired from the surrounding tree lines. The Ukrainian column was stuck. They could not push forward. Enemy fire was coming from the right flank, and they were blocked by the swamps on their left flank. In the end that day, the Ukrainians lost a dozen MRAPs and most of their infantry components, meaning 70 to 80 soldiers. K. <laughs> this is when Ukraine decided to activate some new reserve units due to the critical situation, like this armored platoon equipped with British-made Challenger 2 tanks that eventually went kaput. <laughs> Yeah, baby! <laughs> Meanwhile, on the western flank of the Ukrainian breachhead, Ukrainian forces started offensive operations towards Gloshkovo and the same river. That's how Ukrainian assault detachments stormed Dnizapnoye and kicked out its Russian defenders. In this footage, you can see Ukrainian soldiers removing the Russian flag from the administrative center of the village. Of course, the Ukrainians could have just attacked Glushkovo from across the border. But to do so, they would have to attack Russian units from the front. Meanwhile, they can simply flank all this border area and roll one Russian combat position after another. To do so, a number of Ukrainian units were grouped in this area for their next move. That's also where a Russian Lancet Kamikaze drone destroyed a Russian MRAP near Nizhny Klin. Again, due to the lack of Russian ground forces on the front line, Russian engineers used their Zimli Delier remote mining systems to impede the flow of reinforcements and supplies pouring into the breachhead. Apart from these territorial gains, August 15th was a rough day for the armed forces of Ukraine. The Russian military managed to destroy not one, but two HIMARS using Iskander M ballistic missiles. In this video, we see how a Russian drone stalked the HIMARS for a good amount of time, following its every move before striking it. 
this HIMARS was reportedly destroyed only 8 kilometers away from the border area. One can ask, what was it doing so close to the front? And apparently another one was destroyed just a couple kilometers away from the first one. On the 15th of August as well, Politico released this article where they interview Ukraine soldiers on the Donetsk front, asking them what they think about this Korsk offensive. One of them, Ivan Sekash, the spokesperson of Ukraine's 110th Mechanized Brigade, said, I would say things have become worse in our part of the front. We have been getting even less ammo than before, and the Russians are pushing. Is General Sirsky's gamble going to pay off? Day 11, the 16th of August. That day, there were no major territorial changes to be reported, as Russian reserves arrived to plug the gaps more and more, and Ukrainian forces dealing with these counterattacks. The Russians even released this video of a dozen Ukrainian POWs they captured in Korsk Oblast. However, the big news of the day took place on the west end of the breachhead. In my last video, I said, the Ukraine command is aware of this threat. They tried to destroy the bridge in Glushkovo with a missile strike, but it seems the bridge is still standing. Well, the Ukrainians tried again. And it's gone. As you can see in this video, the bridge is completely done for. Kaput. According to Ukrainian intelligence, the Russians already prepared for this eventuality as they started building a pontoon crossing two kilometers east of the bridge. The problem for Russia is that the bridge in Glushkovo was the strongest one in the sector. There are smaller ones in Karij, Zvanoye, and also one in Kekino. Thing is, apparently the bridge in Zvanoye went from lightly damaged to fully destroyed. Essentially, only this one bridge in Karij is left to supply all the Russian forces positioned south of the same river. Due to this complex logistics situation, this is where we have to discuss the possibility of a Russian withdrawal behind the same river especially with increased Ukrainian pressure in the sector of Tetkino, as well as from this direction where the Ukrainians are flanking the entire Russian battle line. Actually, Russian telegram channels now fear that the Ukrainians open yet another front, but this time against the Bryansk region, which is probably also not very well defended. I personally don't believe it because the surprise effect of crossing the border is gone, and doing so would prevent any Ukrainian concentration of forces at one point, of the front. But, big round but, an attack against Rilsk along the E38 road makes more sense to me. This could be combined with this push from Tetkino, especially after this village got heavily bombed by Ukrainian aviation. And on top of that, if the Ukrainians push beyond Karineva, it's gonna be really bad for Russia. Now that's the thing, the tactical dilemma for Ukraine right now is how they were unable to storm the town of Karineva. These damn cooks and mechanics! So now Ukraine forces are trying to bypass this urban area, both from the west, like we have just seen, but also from the east, and this is facing more resistance. There we have reports of fighting taking place in the sector of Pushkarnoye, a small village 7 kilometers north of Karineva. However, since these villages are also so close from the main highway, these are also the positions the Russians can reinforce very quickly. Now let's take a look at what's going on on the east flank around the town of Suja. By the 16th of August, it was confirmed that Ukrainian forces took control of Borki. That's all there was to report in this area. Now let's take a look at what's happening with Ukraine's group center. The one doing this massive cavalry charge in the open. The Ukrainians used the force between Kremyanoye and Orlivka to concentrate a number of units. It's not a surprise that one of these tree lines got targeted by Russian FAB bombs. Again, not sure if Russian aviation actually hit anything. The only thing we do know is that there was one striker APC that was visually confirmed as destroyed. A great success! More importantly, the Russian armed forces destroyed a German-made IRST medium air defense launcher somewhere in the Sumy region. Shortly after, it was a Ukrainian SA-3 air defense system that got destroyed this time by an orthodox JDAM glide bomb. So as Russian armed forces are trying to contain the Ukrainians into their breachhead, they're destroying their MRLS and air defense systems one by one, without which this entire Ukrainian offensive will just collapse on its own. And just like with the HIMARS the day before, Russian recon drones had no problem flying over Ukrainian territory to find these juicy targets. Day 12, August 17. 
Russian reports mentioned the destruction of an American-made M270 MRLS 40 kilometers from the border. So at this point, in a couple days, we got two HIMARS down, one IRIS-T, one SA-3, and now another MRLS system. This is technical equipment that is extremely important and very hard to replace. And we're not even talking about the time it takes to train all these technicians that are now gone. Disclaimer, some sources claim that the M270 was actually an inflatable decoy. I'm not an expert, but apparently from the drone footage, you could see the inflatable rail above the cabin. It's very interesting to see the Ukrainians flipping back the Maskirovka on the Russians. From an operational perspective, there was some good news for Ukraine. Reports mentioned that fighting intensified on the outskirts of Karinevo. According to the pro-Ukrainian deep state map, Ukrainian forces finally managed to get a foothold inside the town. We know this because a Ukrainian armored vehicle was hit right here as it tried to cross the bridge in the middle of the town. Meanwhile, Russian telegram channels quickly responded by stating that Russian forces are still in control of Karinieva. Like I told you earlier, we have to keep an eye on the Klushkovo district. There was reported that Ukraine forces shelled the shit out of the Tetkino border checkpoint. There is an unusual number of Ukrainian FPV drones now roaming around the area of Rilsk and Lgov, around all these critical Russian logistics hubs and supply lines. I say critical because all the trucks supplying the troops in Korineva have to go through this sector. We could very well see the Ukrainian Korsk offensive shift westwards into this direction, using their available reserves and just clear out their left flank. Other than that, the situation for the Ukrainian group center is not glorious, but things are brewing. We can mention how Ukraine is currently concentrating armored units in the sector of Ruskoye Poreshnoye and Cherkaskoye Poreshnoye. We know this because of these Russian FPV drone strikes on two Ukrainian senator MRAPs in the sector. In my opinion, we could see a Ukrainian attempt to storm the village of Martinovka, which they lost a couple of days ago. The operation would be simple, essentially take the village into a pincer, with an armored attack from the north, as well as from the southern area from Suja along the R200 road. Especially since the Ukrainians just captured the village of Mikhailovka, day 13, August 18th. That day was interesting to say the least, as Ukrainian forces pushed towards Glushkovo, as they captured the settlements of Snagost and Apasanovka, day 14 and 15. August 19th and 20th, Ukraine committed a new reserve unit into the battle. This time it's a battalion of the 95th Airborne Assault Brigade equipped with German-made MADA IFVs. Deep State UA updated the map as Ukrainian forces claimed the capture of Martinovka. Meanwhile, the fog of war continues for Group Center. There are rumors that with the help of the latest reinforcements, Ukrainian mobile columns encircled part of the 18th Motor Rifle Division near Malaya Loknia. Here we see the devastating effect of the attack of a MADA IFV on the Russian positions. As a follow-up of the attack on Snagost, Ukrainian forces stormed the settlement of Vishnevka. Even worse for Russian forces, a number of their pontoon bridges across the same river have been destroyed. In this video, we can even see Ukrainian FPV drones taking out Russian engineering vehicles that were operating between Glushkovo and Svanoe. I think the Ukrainians are preparing to cross the same river in the Kekino Yurasovo sector. To do so, they will have to capture the villages of Komarovka and Krasno Oktyabrskoye. As you can see in this sector, the banks of the same river are extremely forested. And if we zoom in, we see that the river in this sector is only 20 meters wide. This means the Ukrainians will be able to cross the river and install numerous pontoon bridges. And this also means the pontoon bridges will be camouflaged by the entire forested areas. From there, one mobile column could push west and cut off Glushkovo, while another Panzerabteilung pushes north towards the village of Ishutino. And guess what? From there, the Ukrainians can encircle Korineva. Because once again, they can build pontoon bridges across the river since it's so narrow right at this sector. So if Ukraine had one last gamble to pull off for this Kursk offensive, that's the one. And it's not a surprise that fighting was also reported just east of Korineva in the village of Olgovka. This is part of a massive operation to storm and encircle Korineva. 
in the end, in the coming days, we can expect a number of course of actions for the Ukrainian army. We can expect Ukrainian forces to storm Korineva for good, clear the R200 road leading straight to Bolshoi Sodatskoye, which ultimately leads straight to Korsk. They might also try to storm Belitsa in order to secure the road linking that town to Suja, plus an offensive towards Glushkovo. Now the question is, do they have enough forces available to carry out all these combat missions at the same time? Which is essential if they really want to break through the Russian front. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.